and stage artist as well? Yeah. Yeah, stage producer or director. writer, director, okay. Uh, and I can't remember you had a list of pieces, but I, I didn't include them here. No. So, uh, <laughs> currently you're, and you're also doing PhD at UCAN, yeah. uh, University of Quebec. I don't know. Yeah. In Montreal. In Montreal. Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> Is Quebec not just Montreal? <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> not yet. So, um, I don't know if some of you read the... Um, <laughs> or maybe actually that would be uh, kind of nice. Maybe we'll get sponsored by them next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had I, I was a bit ambitious with my uh, abstract, and I had to uh, cut it down quite a bit. So there's a lot in there that I won't get to say, but hopefully maybe uh, some questions will come up later, and I'll can, I can get to those things. So I'm just going to... Um, talk to you about um, uh, some of the work that's been coming out of my PhD and uh, and uh, I kind of just hacked it out of it uh, in a way that I thought would be kind of natural but it, or it turned out to be quite difficult to do because there's a lot there's a lot of dependencies between the chapters and you have to so uh, it turned out to be much more complicated so I'll try to I'll, I'll try to make it um, uh, intelligible and uh, hopefully interesting for you. I'll start by reading um, a quote by Reza Negaristani. If we consider art as a material-driven process of production, these anonymous materials enjoy an autonomy of their own, and such autonomy continuously interferes with the artwork itself, regardless of the decisions of the artist that is, whether or not the artist determines to be open to their influence. Uh, what I find interesting is that in this quote, he's, he's kind of saying, uh, and, and elsewhere he says, that uh, the goal now is not to be open or hospitable to contingency, but to be complicit with it and to, be, to close in with it, to close off with it. And... Uh, and so this question is uh, quite interesting because it renews uh, not only the question of complicity of uh, contingency, but also the question of complicity, which has become another kind of uh, uh, concept for understanding contemporary art. Uh, contemporary art in the last uh, decade or so, with uh, Johanna Drucker, for example. The dissociation of the subjective act from the outcome of the event was a general trend in artistic discourse of the 20th century avant-garde movements. The idea was to distance the artist's decision-making process or subjective intentions from, from the resulting artistic product. Many different methods were used to arrive at this disconnection. To name but a few obvious examples, uh, in Dada we had Tristan Zara's poetic cut-up technique, um, which was one method of arriving at a result that diverged from the will of its author. Marcel Duchamp famously used wind and gravity to produce randomness. In his, uh, in his creation of forms. Surrealism's early infatuation with automatic gestures extended this line of reasoning, though it, uh, uh, though it, uh, it differed in where it sourced the randomness. Accordingly, uh, with Antoine Breton's psychoanalytic influence, surrealism ventured to circumvent subjective intention by appealing to dreams, repressed desires, slips of the tongue, uh, uncontrollable uh, gestures and thoughts. Though uh, Breton later resisted, to a total embracing of autom autonomism by claiming it should be tempered by rational or critical thought. The cadavre, the cadavre Ixqui, uh, also popular with the Surrealists, is an example of yet another strategy producing non-intentional aesthetic products, this time through blind collaboration by combining the imaginations and intentions of multiple artists to arrive at a hybrid monster of an artwork. In the cadavre Ixqui, neither one or the other of us is responsible for the drawing. It is a product of our combined wills and intents, and thus is the contingent resolution of several streams of causality. With the revival of Dada in the 60s uh, Fluxus movement, the explicit emphasis was on change, events, happenings, and the dissolution of the notion of authorship. John Cage is well known for having implemented the I Ching divination practice 
as a method of composition, uh, Matsunis, um, fluxes, the his flux kits were uh, designed to produce contingent events while scrambling their own uh, origin of, uh, or their authorship. Meanwhile, situationism as a political art movement concerned with critiquing and ulti ultimately dissolving the uh, society of the spectacle used randomness generation techniques to scramble society's control topologies in the, uh, in the derive. Thus, in each of these avant-garde practices, the goal is similar, even, even though the mechanism differs. Um, make the event unpredictable, random, or contingent. Make its origins symmetrical so that it may appear as a symmetry-breaking event. In recent years, this has translated into relational aesthetics. Uh, uh, we should also mention that at the, at the time, during the last century, there was a lot of work in improvisation, free improv, jazz, um, various experimental practices, which also exploded onto the scene, and um, each one promoting techniques for dis dis uh, distributing the act or uh, the act of composing the musical work across multiple agents, in effect blurring the causal chain so that no one agent could be credited with the work. Though, though often disguised in various ways, the question of how to care for contingency, has, uh, how to be receptive to it, hospitable to it, or how to conspire with it, as, as Negarastani has suggested, has been at the heart of aesthetics for a long time, perhaps from the beginning, perhaps even before humanity, in what Mayasu calls the ancestral realm. From the beginning will become, an important, will become important as we move forward. Contingency deeply intersects art historical discourse on authorship, style, technique, and practice from the Greek notion of the daimon um, through Commedia dell'arte's uh, improvised styles and romanticism's investment of fatality to the modern cults of madness and primitivism and the avant-garde's explicit use of divination, chance, and automatic processes. Intuitively, this makes sense since uh, the artistic event, like all events, is necessarily known before it happens. It is unpredictable, otherwise it would not be much of an event. And since it emerges in the real, in the deterministic toils resolving tensions between conflicting inertias, all events take on the guise of contingency. Thus the question of contingency in its various masked forms is an inescap inescapable question with regard to creativity. Contingency is the expression of the resolution of tensions between conflicting inertias and fluxes. Uh, Nietzsche would say conflicting wills to power. Different causal chains which collide and combine and result in, what, in that which happens. The event is always contingent in, the, in this sense, always the result of a plethora of different causal lineages propagating through state space. Resolving tensions from point to point, finally arriving at this moment in this place to produce this contingent event. In this sense, the more contingent an event is, or the more unpredictable it is, the less it seems tied to any single will or cause when it happens. All causal lineages seem to converge on the event in a symmetrical fashion. If they didn't, that is, if the probability of the event was asymmetrically stacked, then it would have a, then we would have a way to gauge the probability of the event, and thus it would lose its characteristic unpredictability, hence no longer be contingent. Contingency is articulated on this notion of unpredictability, hence the more an event seems to have happened without a specific asymmetrically def definite cause, the more it will seem to have been caused univocally by all the wills to power, united, or by a symmetrical, undifferentiated whole of causality, something akin to what Deleuze calls the temporality of the event, the ion. Call it what you will, the transcendent, the infinite, the virtual, the symmetrical realm from which all potential expresses itself most univocally in those happenings which do not select a cause, or rather which choose the whole of causality for themselves. The contingent event is thus a symmetry-breaking event, from a symmetrical distribution of potential emerges a completely asymmetrical occasion in its absolute irreversibility and irreducibility. Thus, it is an appeal to the infinite realm of potential. It is as though the event happens as an expression of divine will, 
since no worldly will or causal chain seems to directly account for it. This angle of approach to contingency, the idea of symmetry breaking borrowed from physics, allows us to link art, philosophy, science, and spiritual practices with regard to their respective types of hospitality or inclusion of these symmetry breaking events. Probability is symmetry. When there is an equal probability of an event uh, happening or not happening, then, the, then its probability distribution can be said to be symmetrical. Thus, each time we throw the dice, there is an equal chance either of the faces will come up. And this equal probability is a direct factor of the object's platonic symmetry. Probability of symmetry is, in fact, the name of a book by a philosopher of mathematics, Christoph Birdsey. It lays out the foundation of statistics according to this principle. But for our purposes, the essential thing to know is that when all outcomes are equally probable in the, spa in the space of possible outcomes, then the, probability of is symmet uh, then the probability is symmetrically distributed among these possible outcomes. Hence, my point is that the more symmetrical the probabilities, the less predictable the event. So chance devices, such as dice, often implement some geometrical symmetry, the, flip, the flipping of coins, the uh, roulette or choice wheel, which is symmetrically divided, um, the uh, shuffling of a deck of cards. In these, the problem of summoning chance is relegated to a material object that has symmetrical distributions. But there are other systems for producing randomness, which instead of relying on a symmetrical geometry, rely on an algorithmic or deterministic or deterministic procedure. The work of the diviner in Bamana divination practices, for example, uh, implements a modulo two addition algorithm, which is an implementation of a kind of su pseudo random number generator, like those programmed into computers. Um, you start by drawing four sets of random dashes in the sand. Then you pair the dashes up to, de and to determine which row is odd and which row is even, and record the result with one dash or two. Repeat this four times to give four different symbols at the end of each row. Then recursively modulo two these results, applying the same folding reduction onto the outputs, sometimes by pairing them vertically, sometimes by pairing them horizontally. The process requires several recursive levels of addition modulo 2, for it is really a game of scrambling the original pattern drawn. Much like a cryptographer's cipher, it is a way of taking a known number and deterministically scrambling it with a complicated set of algorithmic procedures, partly intended to ensure the diviner could not have consciously planned to produce the given outcome. The diviner is basically implementing a way to randomize his own action to distance himself from his own intention or free will in an explicit scrambling of the initial gesture. According to the ethno-mathematician Ron Eglash, uh, their system simulates deterministic chaos. This means that the outcome, though completely deterministic and bound to the simple rules of the recursive process, is nevertheless extremely difficult to predict or for the results to be retraced to an initial condition. Eglash speculates that uh, Georg Cantor's theory of transfinite sets, which tamed the notion of infinity, while also unleashing its monsters and paradoxes, can be traced back to these African divination systems through the links between Western geomancy and these African practices. He, al he also claims that the bi binary arithmetic eventually invented by Leibniz, and which is ultimately responsible for the invention of computers, uh, we, uh, can be traced back to African fortune-telling uses of modulo 2 arithmetic. The computer, interestingly, is our modern oracle. We often, but we often forget that this is, in fact, precisely Leibniz's, this was, in fact, precisely Leibniz's dream when he first imagined the computer. What he called the stepped reckoner uh, was an early mechanical calculator, a precursor to the com computer inspired by Pascal's adding machine, the Pascaline. Leibniz believed all thought could be translated from natural language, which was subject to interpretation, to an absolute mathematical language, a universal language or script, which could precisely translate the truths of reason and which could allow for the univocal calculation of all problems of logic. He thought that the universal language was clear enough 
in its particularity, that he thought if the universal language was clear enough in its particularity, even if complex in its generality, it could be processed by a machine. He found somewhat of a confirmation for this idea um, in the dualities of the I Ching, the ancient book of changes, the Chinese uh, book of changes, which depicted time and the universe through conflicting dichotomies such as dark, light, male, female, yin, yang, and which he recognized corresponded to a base two counting scheme, much like the system of numbers he had developed. That's his machine again. Um, <coughs> Ching. He apparently realized that a base two uh, would be a simpler way of implementing calculations in machines, though he never got around to building a machine, a binary calculating machine. His philosophy of combination posited that everything was composed of absolute identities and that uh, with a sufficiently robust mechanism, one could dial in binary encoded questions into a mechanical computer and could step through to the correct answer. The history of, computi of computing thus begins with a kind of mechanical divination oracle. And evidently, near the end of his life, Leibniz believed that the binary system held some sort of mystical power or significance. Interestingly, there are now several apps that allow us to use our mobile smartphones and tablets for fortune-telling purposes. <laughs> I Ching apps, tarot apps. There's even a situationist derive app. <laughs> uh, but right from the beginning, the uh, computer was imagined as a kind of oracle that would grant us access to deeper truths as a machine for automating or commanding divine revelation. Uh, so now let's talk about chaos. We have known since Poincaré, Poincaré and the three-body problem in the 19th century that deterministic systems <laughs> can and do lead to unpredictable nonlinear behavior. Deterministic, chaotic behavior arises over time from the amplification of the imprecision of our approximations from the intervals upon which our measurement segments necessarily fall. In the continuous systems of classical dynamics, the continuous curves describing uh, functions over time necessarily fall upon intervals, unavoidably glossing over infinitesimal differences and these inevitably express themselves in time for all but the most trivial interactions as the unknown complexities hidden in the gap diffuse through state space, resulting in, topological, in the topological mixing of uh, traje trajectories. Each trajectory in time gets arbitrarily close to every point in the system. In the completely distinct paradigm of quantum mechanics, a second model for randomness is observed in nature a discrete time model where probabilities are determined at the moment of measurement or observation. In quantum systems, the randomness is said to be intrinsic, where um, uh, there will never be a way to know the events themselves, uh, Einstein, as Einstein would have wished, but only the probability of there being an event of such and such a type at this or that location in space-time. In biology, things get even messier because these two types of randomness participate and propagate across organizational strata, as well as in top-down and bottom-up propagations, transversely translating boundary conditions through the nested levels of the organism in what uh, Giuseppe Longo has called uh, bioresonance. Gilles Deleuze's philosophy attempts an inversion of this principle in order to provide his thought with uh, what he calls endo and exo-consistency. Chaos, for him, is not the result of external noise that interferes with the structural constraints of the system, but rather the structural constraints of the system are themselves produced by chaos. Deleuze rests creativity from notions of resemblance, reference, representation, regarding them as inadequate to account for novelty on their own. Uh, much like mathematical systems are incomplete, though, inconsi though consistent. It follows that notions like species, genera, organism, and selection refer exclusively to characteristics of the plane of organization or the plane of reference, and thus exclusively to the symmetries established within a given causal regime. Um, I should say, uh, no, I should. 
we give, <laughs> we gives, he gives the truly creative role to what he calls the intensive playing, uh, which I, later with Guattari is related to uh, chaos. They call it chaos later on. Though he insists it is sterile and inefficacious. Sterile and inefficacious. So though this may seem counterintuitive, it is not contradictory if we understand that causality itself is produced and conditioned. A given causal regime emerges only within a well-defined, only within a, a model that is defined by its symmetries. As uh, Giuseppe Longo has explained, uh, symmetries are the building blocks of intelligibility in science. So a model, any model, it's, I get, I, we should relate this to uh, what uh, Marcus Boone was saying uh, earlier about uh, topos theory. And I'm not sure what Alain Badiou says about topos theory, but uh, but uh, but it's uh, I think it was a, a, along the similar similar lines. Each uh, model of it, uh, intelligibility comes with its own symmetries, and they're not necessarily you can't really translate one into the other in any smooth fashion. They're all kind of autonomous. And so what uh, Deleuze is saying is that these it's these models of uh, these regimes of causality they get created uh, by by chaos. Um, so the intensive plane can thus be thought of along the lines of the boundary conditions whence chaos emerges in dynamic system, in dynamic systems. So the boundary conditions are, from the point of view of science, usually called usually accounted for as as noise. They call it noise, right? Noise entering the system because on on the outside of the boundary, the symmetries break down. There's no, there, there's a symmetry that the, the boundary is a symmetry breaking uh, location. And so the inside of the, the inside of the system is where those symmetries are uh, uh, function logically, and and uh, whatever else enters the system is noise, or and eventually chaos. The boundary is the limit of the referential model or causal regime. All models, all systems, all thoughts have a blind spot. Experience is bounded. But events always happen through or on this boundary. Contingency is the rupture of the topology of the blind spot or amnesia, which composes experience as a kind of surface effect. Deterministic chaos emerges from the inevitable interval of real world measurements and efficient causality hence only begins once measurement has taken place, once it has been actualized in this or that objectivity, i.e. mathematical model. Uh, just as Whitehead, just as in Whitehead, um, potential is only actualized once felt or apprehended, or um, uh, each actual occasion perishes in its satisfaction. And uh, in Simondon, similarly, uh, individuation ceases ceases when it uh, exhausts its pre-individuality. I wanted to write more about Simondon near the end of this paper, but uh, I cut it out. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be eager to respond. Um, chaos enters the circuits of efficient causality through measurement and observation, which align with or follow the limits of the plane of reference where they effectively are indiscernible from the plane of imminence. The boundaries that define the limits of one system and another, those zones of indetermination which, which constitute phase transitions and symmetry breaks, where propagations fold back into chaotic reverberations. And thus, once the chaotic effects expressed through the system originate, seem fully compatible with Deleuze's claim that the surface is the deepest level of being quoting Paul Valéry. <clears throat> the contingent event enters the body or model through its boundary, where the causality of the system breaks down. Thus, the event itself is incorporeal. According to Deleuze's reading of classical Stoicism, incorporeality is a diminished form of being, not being per se, but actually an attribute of being, a surface effect of bodies. It is in this sense that the event is sterile and inefficacious. Quasi-causal, he says. It is outside of efficient causality. Quasi-causality can be construed as a cause for causality, 
very much along the lines of uh, Leibniz's uh, transcendental argument, which we will get to later. So randomness doesn't merely enter the system through intervals of measurement and bounded rationality. As we said earlier, uh, uh, randomness can be created through deterministic processes. Just as some divination practices uh, use deterministic scrambling techniques to obtain randomness, computer science has discovered that undecidability and unpredictability can emerge from the simplest rule-based algorithms. Though defined by simple algorithmic rules of sequence, programs like uh, Stephen Wolfram's uh, Rule 110 and Rule 30 nevertheless take off in their own dimensions between the gaps afforded uh, by the digital system and refound an unpredictable creative concrescence. Wolfram suggests that these types of systems are, oh, I should move on to this image, which is one of his rules. So Wolfram, just to uh, introduce Wolfram for those who don't know, he's this uh, physicist, mathematician, uh, who became very interested in cellular automata and uh, for 20 or so years uh, systematically uh, churned out all of the different rules because there's a, there's a uh, finite uh, rule space for each one of these uh, cellular automata. These are, these are unidimensional cellular automata, so they just, they're just one line. And depending on what you put, uh, the random seeds that you inject into that first line, and depending on the rules, uh, they produce different things. And so what he does is systematically, um, uh, systematically uh, iterate all of the different rules that could be possible in that space. So the rules ha have to do with like uh, relationships between neighboring uh, um, cells in the automaton. So um, Wolfram suggests that these types of systems of undecidability, some of these systems produce undecidability, like room, uh, uh, Rule 30, Rule 110. They, uh, instead of producing very uh, symmetrical or uh, fractal-like nesting patterns, they, they produce constant irreducibility, like just constant noise, basically. Kind of like um, irrational numbers that never repeat. You know, these kinds of, these things that don't repeat and so have uh, Kolmogorov complexity, or like high complexity, they're extremely complex and irreducible. Though, anyway, you, I'll, I'll get to more of that, but anyway. Um, Wolfram suggests that these types of systems are of, uh, of undecidability are more common in the universe than those that are decidable. The, the undecidable is a factor of what he calls computational equivalence. He reasons that there is an upper limit to the complexity of a compu that a com computation can have. For as soon as a program is Turing universal, meaning as soon as it can simulate any other program like a Turing machine can, then being universal, there is nowhere more complex for it to go, since it can now potentially simulate its own universe, given enough time and resources. So if so many equations in the world of computation and mathematics are undecidable to us, he speculates it is because our, he speculates it because these computations are of equal sophistication as the ones simulating our own conscious processes. Accordingly, his theory suggests that human consciousness has naturally gravitated toward computations which were less sophisticated than its own. Wolfram, of course, has its, has its critics. The mathematician Lawrence Gray dismantles Wolfram's argument that his Rule 30 one-dimensional cellular auto automaton produces intrinsic randomness. The idea of intrinsic randomness is one of Wolfram's conceptual pillars, which he attempts to distinguish from the so-called extrinsic randomness found in chaotic systems, in which the randomness is expressed in time through a system uh, said to emerge from the complexity within the unknown intervals of the measurement. Thus, Wolfram is trying to say that in his simple, discrete, rule-based experiments, there are no intervals, only absolutely known Laplacian uh, initial conditions. A subset of these rules 
will lead to completely irreducible sequence progressions. Here's another one. More. This is rule 30, I think. There's a continuous, uh, he, made one, he made some that are, that have, that he calls continuous, that they're not really continuous, but they kind of resolve con continuities. Okay. Uh, I, have to get, I have to read faster now, I think. No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Okay. So, um, of course we know that they are, so he said, a subset of these rules will lead to a completely irreducible sequence progressions. Uh, of course, we know they are reducible in the sense that we know the initial conditions that give way to such random results because we know, we know the original program he used to create them. So we know they're reducible in that sense. Um, uh, but the problem is if we encountered these uh, shapes in nature, there would be no way of, of uh, finding the initial program. Uh, because there's, there's, uh, because essentially, as Gray mentions, in a sense, th these are no different from advanced cryptography procedures already uh, implemented. Uh, Rule 30 is a very sophisticated pseudo-random number generator, similar to the ones used, though more complex than the ones used by uh, Bamana diviners. From this perspective, it is tempting to liken Wolfram's research to a modern-day divination practice. The pages of his over 1,300-page book, A New Kind of Science, is concerned with promoting himself as the inventor of a new age of knowledge articulated on this concept of computational equivalence. This is the essential concept in, his, in the historical paradigm he would like to offer to humanity. Computational equivalence harkens back to aesthetics, though Kant's distinction uh, through Kant's distinction between the beautiful and the sublime. Roughly, the beautiful is that which is agreeable and thus links directly to the al those algorithms studied by Wolfram which he sees as being of trivial complexity. Trivial programs are those that consistently reproduce desired results or produce repetitions in nestle fractal-like patterns. From a computational point of view, repetition is less complex than what does not repeat, for it, is, for it can be compressed contracted easily. The sublime, however, is that which induces fear, that which surpasses our capacities or capture, uh, ca capacities of capture, and um, they uh, perhaps threaten our life or our intelligence. This is uh, similar to the, qual the qualities Wolfram finds in programs of universal complexity, such as his Rule 110, which meet the limit of complexity by being able to virtualize any other program. They are thus sublime in this very aesthetic sense. They meet or surpass our computational capacities. Undecidability and unpredictability are threatening, for they announce the limit of our free will. Furthermore, it is interesting to note that Wolfram, Wolfram's work is very much an aesthetic endeavor. He ponders over a plethora of these computer-generated graphics, systematically looking for the ones that might exhibit truly random behavior because random behavior emerging from simple rule-based systems is a big deal. It means that even without intervals, even without gaps, once, we wi uh, once uh, within the well-defined bounds of a given causal regime, certain initial conditions will give rise to undecidability. Our embeddedness within the world, within uh, symmetry-breaking qua experience, causes us to have certain biases. In particular, since events always happen as symmetry-breaking events, we have a tendency to understand our origins as symmetry or as undifferentiated unity. Anthropology, for example, internally criticizes its own tendency to hypostatize an original unity of, of thought in tribal culture, where subjectivity and objectivity are said to be indistinct. The same bias for interpreting origins as homogeneous and undivided unity crops up in the cosmological account. Uh, the universe, according to physics, itself emerged from a singularity containing all matter, energy, and uh, potential in space-time, unfolded into a dimensionless point, uh, folded into a dimensionless point, before the Big Bang. Now here, before is in scare quotes, because the notion of causal sequence breaks down at this limit, for time itself is only intelligible, intelligible as the breaking of symmetry of that original singularity. Thus, in physics as well, the question of the origin is to be scrutinized, 
for it seems that uh, just as anthropology has had the tendency to project an assumption of unity on the human origin, the cosmological anthropic principle suggests that the, the singularity before the Big Bang is itself a projective mapping or extrapolation that results from our being embedded within symmetry-breaking processes. For all observation, all experience is the breaking of symmetries. Just as in quantum mechanics, the act of measuring collapses the wave function, deciding irreversibly the value of the measurement by selecting between the quantum object's superimposed states, the human observing nature with its factuality as an undeniable truth about the universe selects from the infinite possibilities of how, um, how old our universe is and what the values of the cosmological constants are. This has led to speculation on the fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, the Big Bang is a breaking of a symmetry, the unfolding of a singularity, or the deciding of an actual universe from an infinite virtuality of potential universes. If this is true, there's a real sense in which each event of experience, science would say observation, is thus a continuation of the breaking of symmetry represented by the Big Bang in our current cosmology. The science is also locked into something akin to the correlational circle described by Mayasu. Mayasu critiqued Kant's philosophical Copernican revolution as Ptolemaian uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, anti-Copernican. Ironically, the cosmological anthropic principle, pr uh, principle was first proposed by physicist Brandon Carter on the occasion of Copernicus's 500th anniversary. It has meant uh, kind of, it, it was meant as a kind of limitation to the Copernican doctrine. If Copernicus displaced the human being from the center of the universe and refuted our observational biases, the anthropic principle had to acknowledge a limitation to this. Indeed, science has had to tackle the unavoidable problem of correlation and feedback. We saw some of those before, quantum mechanics and chaos. We are not at the center of the universe, but there is a sense in which our very being here our mode of being uh, as observers made of carbon-based organic material on the surface of this planet, around this star, in this galaxy of a certain age, necessarily implies some limitations as to what we can expect to observe in the universe. Thus, in our observations, in our experiences, we participate in the unfolding of the universe. The well-known physicist John Archibald Wheeler... Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm almost, uh, let's see, should I, let me just finish with this section here. John Wheeler put this differently, suggesting that the only possible universe is one in which observers exist, and thus in which there is a fundamental asymmetry. The universe can only exist as participatory, this ver his version of the poorly named anthropic principle. The, the information that constitutes our scientific observation of the universe can only be afforded through asymmetry. Thus, the various cosmic forces and interactions and the charges and spins of the subatomic particles are like debts yet to be repaid to an original symmetry, and all time is the interval, the wait for an eventual reimbursement. The second law of thermodynamics can, be, can indeed be read as a payoff of this debt, as the universe slowly trickles into its basins of attraction, creeping its way to an eventual final equilibrium. The arrow of time is a kind of cipher, scrambling the traces of the original asymmetry, um, anisotropy, with, the, um, with an ever more complex codec. Thus, asymmetry is the name of time. Time lifts off from the original homogeneous singularity while also resisting the universe's final equilibrium. Heat death would be the end of time. Time is the gap between symmetries. But no matter how far back we peer into the cosmos or how far we extrapolate the current asymmetrical situation, there is an infinite regress toward a supposedly symmetrical origin. The infinite tower of turtles on which reality rests is an infinite series of contingent causes for arbitrary effects, all of which are breaks in previous symmetries. They are asymmetrical and thus must be explained by deeper symmetries, which in turn reveal themselves as asymmetries and so on. When we ha will have explained the supersymmetry of fermions and bosons, we will still have to look at why the Big Bang was there in the first place, why that symmetry was broken in the first place. As Michel Cassé notes, origins are always provisional. John Wheeler suggested 
that the only way to get out of this infinite regress was to appeal to a, a circular causation, to, to, and I quote, to endlessness no alternative is evident but loop, such a loop as this. Physics gives rise to observer participancy, observer participancy gives rise to information, and information gives rise to physics. Positing such a, an original cause for causality resonates with Leibniz's cosmological argument for universal sufficient reason, which we mentioned earlier. And now I quote him. And as all this detail again involves other prior and more detailed contingent things, each of which still needs a similar analysis to yield its reason, we are no further forward, and the sufficient or final reason must be outside of the sequence or series of particular contingent things, however infinite this series may be. So in Leibniz's account, there must be a cause that is outside of time, outside of the contingencies of linear co efficient causality. The reason for contingency is necessarily not contingent, but necessary, a truth that is its own cause, a causal loop outside of time. Leibniz thus reasons much, much like Wheeler if we want to avoid the infinite regress, we have to posit a loop of some kind. This cosmic self-cause for Leibniz is God, one single causal loop of necessary truth that accounts for the, all of the efficient causalities, uh, all of efficient causalities contingent truths. It is remarkable and somewhat ironic that this is precisely what Mayesu ends up saying in his after finitude, though for completely different uh, uh, argumentative reasons. Mayasu's goal of allowing thought access to the absolute, which the circularity of correlationism has prevented, is articulated on this question. There can only be one necessary absolute, contingency itself. I'll stop there. So. Sorry for so long. <laughs>